Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, which has now been in virtual mode for the last four months. Uh, we've been covering the same sorts of issues as we were covering in real life, uh, or, albeit in a, in a virtual Zoom universe. Uh, today, we have two very, very distinguished uh, former politicians uh, now who have gone legitimate. Both of them were members of the European Parliament. Both of them were very influential in the European Parliament, particularly, but not exclusively on financial services. Kay Swinburne, who is now the Vice Chair of Financial Services at KPMG, was the uh, former Conservative MEP for Wales from 2009 to 2019, uh, ex-Deutsche Bank. She, as the, uh, at the European Parliament, she was Vice Chairman of Econ, which was, the, was and is the critical committee for the financial services sector. She's recently been talking about uh, the revisions to MIFID II, urging the EU not to make radical changes to it. Uh, she has a, and this is interesting, I think both of our speakers have PA PhDs, but Kay has a PhD in medical research, which these days sounds awfully relevant. The, our other speaker is Saeed Kamal, uh, who, has, as I'm sure you know, was a, an MEP from May 2005 when he replaced Theresa Villas to 2019. He's now the Academic and Research Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs here in London and the Professor of International Relations and Politics at St. Mary's University in Twickenham. He's been act he was active in the Brexit debate, has all sorts of views on both uh, the kinds of social issues thrown up by the COVID epidemic here, but also I think on financial services in general. The running order is that Kay gets to talk first, Saeed gets to respond to what Kay has to say, and my colleague Jane Fuller gets to intervene because she is really interested in corporate governance issues, accounting issues, and all those things that sometimes I want to put my head in the gas oven as soon as I hear them. So can I give you Kay Swinburne, Kay from KPMG these days? Thank you, Andrew. And um, I'd just like to actually talk about some of the shifts we're seeing currently within the business world and in particular amongst our clients at KPMG. But I'd like to tie that back in particular to the financial services sector, the one that I spend most of my time working with. And I do believe that there is a massive shift right now and has been for some time going on, where we're shifting from what I would call the old shareholder model to now the new stakeholder model. And we saw major announcements in the US last year with big companies deciding that they needed to take a much broader outlook on where they fit within the society and communities that they serve. And I think that shift is happening and has been accelerated with the COVID pandemic. And for me, it's all about working out how financial services fit into this new paradigm. How do they serve the communities in which they sit? And how do they actually become good citizens of the world? And the reality is that without that capital flow, there is no business, there is no economy to, to be able to support. So for me, it's very important that they play a really important part and think about the actions that they have. Now, the COVID pandemic is obviously going to bring about what is going to be one of the harshest recessions that we'll have seen in this country and probably globally. And therefore, it's going to be a time of change and a time of inflection, a time that they can actually take stock and say, how are we going to build back better? And that phrase has been used a lot, but I think it needs to have a lot of unpicking. And for me, it's really important that we actually consider within the ESG, so that whole environmental, social and governance package that we've been talking about for the last few years. And there's been a big regulatory drive to try and improve the ESG footprint of fund managers' activities in their portfolios and across the banking sector in terms of how their, their loan book looks and who they lend money to, that is going to actually be accelerated. And for me, that's a really good thing. But the focus so far has been on the climate risk, has been on the E, and I think post-COVID we're going to see it being on the S. So that's social value. Who is actually doing the right thing? And I think the lens that people are going to be looking at, those companies operating throughout COVID, will be very different. It will be, did they do the right thing during this crisis? So did the banks lend money when they were being asked to lend money when they had various regulatory capital requirements relaxed in order to free up their balance sheets for lending to the real economy? Did the companies who used government schemes 
the financial stimulus measures, use them properly? Or did they not use them in the right way? All of these things will actually start to actually be unpicked once this crisis is over. And I think that lens where social value and doing the right thing is going to be part of our daily lives for a long time to come. And I do genuinely think that the ESG agenda is here to stay. People know that they can do the right thing and make returns for investors. But the investor community is going to have to make a bigger effort. They're going to have to scrutinize their investments, not just for what makes them the best return for their investors, but also whether or not the companies they're investing in are doing the right thing. You're going to hear an awful lot more about this throughout the next few years. I think it's really important that can companies deliver this wider social value and can the financial services sector acknowledge those who are doing that and acknowledge them with some form of financial benefit. So for me, it's an opportunity to change the way we look at the world, to make business contribute in a way that they probably haven't had to in a long while. But I think state intervention is also here to stay. We'd already heard all sorts of comments about how small state, big companies, private sector influence. And we've gone through a long period now where we've had a relatively small state and a big private sector. But the inequalities have grown. So I think we're actually now at a stage where the cycle has turned. We're going to see a much more prolonged state intervention, particularly in Europe. And then we're going to actually see that major switch where the state has a big role, but that means there's conditionality to the money that they put in. So the projects that they're going to do will be greener. The projects they do will actually be in a location, potentially, that will perform a levelling up function to make sure that some of those inequalities between North, South, East and West will actually start to diminish. So I think we're going to see a lot more state intervention for quite some time. We're going to see a lot more conditionality on money flowing. And I genuinely think, ultimately, we're going to have a very different society who demand more from their businesses, demand more from financial services. And actually, hopefully, it means we have a better society overall. Well, can I ask you a question then on that? I mean, is the financial services sector going to have the financial resources, as it were, to meet the demands that you're putting up? It's being squeezed at the present time. A lot of the loans that are being pushed through the banks are going to default. There's going to be a real problem there. I see your arguments for a greater state intervention here, but the banks themselves are going to find themselves under strain, are they not, at the same time as the demands being placed on them are greater? Well, actually, post the financial crisis, and and Said and I were both in Brussels doing financial services legislation throughout the decade of 2009-19, that period of unprecedented regulation on the financial sector has meant that we've got much better capitalised banks, not just in Europe and in the UK, but actually globally. So I think the banking sector is quite well placed right now to be able to step up. And we've taken some of those capital requirements away, which were built up deliberately to be able to cope with a period like this, to allow that lending to be released as and when it was required. So I think the regulatory environment has meant the banks have got effectively an armory available to them. Many of them are using it very, very actively right now. And of course, on the small companies, the SME sectors, where we're going to see a large number of those defaults, you've genuinely got the 100% guarantee coming from the government. So as the state, once again, who's going to pick up that particular bill. So the taxpayers ultimately will pay for the SME sectors, companies who default under those bounce back loans. The larger companies, the banks are still 20% on the hook, but the state is on the hook for 80% of it. And I do believe that you will find during these times, the state will also have to step in with potentially recapitalization of some of those companies in strategic sectors to make sure that you end up with a thriving UK economy going forward. I think the state is likely to take equity holdings in a very large number of companies going forwards for the short and medium term to allow them to actually protect strategic industries that actually then protect the future growth of the economy going forwards. So I think you know that state intervention, as much as a conservative former conservative MEP, it actually pains me to say but I think the state is going to do a much more active role going forward. Not, not only a former Conservative MEP, but the d- academic director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. That must be difficult for you to take on, uh, Said. Uh, but do you, do you accept um, Kay's general analysis? <laughs> 
Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't think there's much I disagree with there um, in terms of the, the fact that the state will get bigger. I mean, we, we've seen that. And there's been a decision for government. Um, do, you know, do you let all these people's jobs go to the wall and then you end up paying them benefit and then you've got to then get them back into work once we have a recovery, at whatever sort of recovery you have, whether that's a U-shape or a V-shape recovery or a W recovery or, or, or whatever. The fact is, you know, these people, are, what we've seen here, which is quite different to some of the previous crises, has actually been a supply side crunch. Um, you know, there are, it's, it hasn't been demand and it's been supplied there because you know, companies have shut down, companies can't offer their services, um, you know, pe people aren't, 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 be, aren't being paid or have to tighten the belt. In some ways, it means actually people have got a lot more money, those who are lucky enough to still have jobs, but they just can't spend that money unless they spend all day, unless they spend all day online. The, the only places where I may uh, potentially disagree with Kay is that in some, way, in some ways it's way too early to tell whether, the, you know, what was going to be a long-term trend. We really don't know yet how much the world will change once we go back. Of course, we hear lots of people saying things will never be the same. Um, you know, I'm reflecting far more on my life. I'm taking up new hobbies or I'm taking new interests or I'm, I'm, I'm volunteering more in my local community. But what will happen when we, when, when we are allowed back, whether there's a, uh, a vaccination or whether you know, the R number goes right down? Um, some of us won't forget, and we will uh, change our life. Others will just bounce back. The pubs will be full on Fridays. You know, the parks will be full. People will go back and start flying again. So we don't know. And the other thing is, you know, all the way through this, um, this uh, lockdown, you've seen the media try to judge which country is better than the other, and that keeps changing. So one minute, Germany's doing far better. Um, uh, China, we're never sure which figures to believe from China. Uh, you know, is doing quite well. Suddenly, we see you know Germany's R numbers gone up, or uh, China suddenly has you know they seem to be having a second wave. So it's in some ways it's way too early to tell what the long term trends will be. I think uh, one one of my colleagues, Steve Davis, uh, who's a histor an economic historian, wrote about previous uh, pandemics. And one of the things he said that major pandemics tend to accelerate and magnif magnify trends and processes that are were already underway making them happen more rapidly and go further than otherwise would have been the case. So we are seeing uh, some trends that were pre-existing. So for example, in the world of trade, which I'm writing a lot about at the moment, there were already existing tensions with uh, China. There were already existing uh, protectionist measures, uh, noises coming from both the US and the EU. Some of that uh, will uh, accelerate. There are already more demands from some consumers to have more locally produced food, even before the COVID crisis. Some of these trends will be accelerated by the, by the pandemic. But the other thing is how companies respond. And I think we've got to be very skeptical when companies tell you that they are far more uh, engaged societally. And I think we have to judge them by their deeds and not their words. So let's take a few examples. HSB, for example, has a wonderful campaign called We Are Not An Island, saying about how wonderful we are and the UK is a wonderful country. And you know, the best way that you can live your life is to have a wonderfully open society. You think, oh, great, that's really good. HSBC is in favor of open societies. And then you look at their actions in China, where they support the Chinese government's new basic law, Clemmer Down in Hong Kong. Um, you know, and you think, well, hold on a minute. Here is this a company that is telling us that they believe in open societies, yet they're supporting one of the most oppressive regimes. We saw the same thing in uh, the States uh, in response to the tragic killing of George Floyd and BLM. You see companies such as Nike and Nike or Nike and Vans taken to social media saying, you know, uh, telling their followers, create change, proactively be part of the change. Uh, you know, Google and Apple have pledged large donation sums to some of the organizations such as the NACP, um, NACP, um, but interestingly enough, when thousands of peaceful protesters took the streets in Hong, took the streets in Hong Kong in a stand against the Chinese government, Apple and Google removed all the protest-related apps. Nike has dropped some of the NBA merchandise from its stores in China when American basketball managers have been tweeting in support of the protesters. So in some ways, I think we've got to be skeptical about companies who want to be seen to be good, but actually I think we have to judge them by their actions. The other issue I think we've got to be well aware of is you know, the days of when Milton Friedman said the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. Now, in some ways, he's right. But being profitable is also about understanding your customers, not upsetting them, not upsetting your workers, and not being in the media for negative reasons, because those all have, that is, all could have an impact on your bottom line or, 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 or your profit. Now, companies used to have a fiduciary duty to pursue profit. And, and, and part of that is, you know, create jobs and also create returns for, 
uh, workers' pension funds. But of course, we know in the UK, we've had this concept of enlightened shareholder value, which means that you know, companies have to consider wider stakeholders. Now, I think what has, you can do both, and it's great if companies can be profitable and do, and do both and be aware of their wider stakeholders. But in simple terms, it should come down to this. Make profit, yes, treat your workers well, treat your customers well. Um, but more than that, I think that's the question which individual companies themselves will have to decide. I think it's wonderful when you see volunteerism and you see companies giving their time, their staff off time to volunteer with local organizations and to do good in society. But there has to be a balance. I think the last thing we should look at is what Kay was talking about. It's all very well having activist managers, but we now see uh, more investors being activist share shareholders. And I think we're going to see more pressure from investors, even before the pandemic, to make sure that, that some of the, the organizations and companies that they're investing in do comply with many of the principles in the ESG regulation. I'll stop there. So, Jane, these, this is um, straight up your street. Um, well, um, an initial point. I think that the um, idea that um, there's a clash between pursuing shareholder value and stakeholder value is misplaced. That um, actually, uh, more or less as I has just said, um, you, you do not create shareholder value if you abuse your employees, your suppliers, and pollute the environment. So I think that the the, the base is has always been there, and we may be having the pendulum swinging back because of concerns about inequality, which is right. So, for example, um, low pay. Um, pay in the UK had, had been so low that some people were in full-time work and still receiving benefits. So there's um, that redressing of some of those balances is, was already in train and, and will be accelerated. Um, I'm interested in um, just going back to what um, Kay was saying, which is was very much in favour of preserving strategic businesses and so on. When does... Um, when does a business stop being strategic and start being a zombie company? And how do you aid the transition, which it sounds as though in principle you want, from some of the older, maybe dirtier sectors to some of the newer, cleaner, more exciting ones? Okay, well, that's important. So Project Birch, is that just going to produce very, very large um, zombie companies because it's really focused on those firms which are perceived to be, at least by politicians, too big to fail, for instance. Yeah, yeah and this is going to be a major problem. I, in some respects, I'm glad I'm no longer the politician having to, to, to actually decide. And, and it's ultimately, who do you decide to let go to the wall and who do you decide to save? And, you know, politicians historically have not been terribly good at picking winners versus losers in, in the economy. So, I mean, ultimately, there have to be some proper measures there has to be an overall strategy for what they consider to be key and strategic. And they have to actually be able to step aside and say, you know, is this viable, not just in the short term if we support it, but is it viable in the long term in that new world you're looking to transition to? So if there is a heavy carbon intensive industry, do they have a proper transition plan for how they get to net zero, at least by 2050, if not before? If they're receiving state money, I suggest 2050 is too late. That plan needs to be a lot earlier than that in order to have state money and to be funded by the government that has a strategy for net zero at the latest of 2050. There are some big key problems here that, you know, choosing an industry, choosing a sector. And, you know, we've seen the EU already do that. The EU with it, within its, its plan has put out a, a big framework document and they've chosen certain sectors. The German government did the same thing last week and has you know, major investments in electric vehicles, major investments in hydrogen. I mean, huge investments on green technologies, but everyone's doing it. So the Chinese are doing it. The, you know, every European country is doing it, including European sort of funding from a central EU pot. And you just wonder whether or not there's enough space for all of this investment. And if it's a race, do our companies sort of win or are they going to be falling behind because they have potentially more investment in a different region or they're luckier? I mean, having been a researcher in, in a lab, I can tell you an awful lot of your results are down to luck. 
You know, you have good hypotheses and you have good you know, theories of what's going to happen, but somebody can pick you to the post really easily, even if you spend many, many years working on something. Mm-hmm. So, you know, first mover advantage in some of these technologies is going to be important because of the, the you know, IP on it. So I, I wouldn't like to be in government right now choosing which of those sectors are strategic for the medium and long term, not just the short term intervention to save jobs. But I'm sure you'll go back into politics at some stage. So, Said, picking winners and losers, this is something that must be anathema to, uh, to a right-thinking conservative economist. Yes, um, you're absolutely right. Um, it is anathema. And it's, um, you know, you have to, um, and you can understand it. I mean, what, one, of the, one of the uh, interesting phenomena that you see in economics and business is, the, uh, is unintended consequences. And you've seen a number of organizations that have been chosen as potential winners. And what happens? Uh, first of all, you know, it's a misallocation of resources um, uh, and resources that could, that could have been used for, for, for other things. Sometimes what happens, you end up squeezing out more innovative uh, startup competitors um, by the fact that you've, that you've chosen winners. And the thing you've got to always, always be careful about is what are the criteria? It is a difficult choice for politicians, but if politicians are going to go down this route, they should be absolutely transparent about the criteria and let that be a subject to the criticism of the media, the opposition, the business community. The worst thing you can have is what we call rent seeking. And we used to see this quite a lot in Brussels when we were politicians. Companies would come to us and lobby us for regulation. And what they were really doing, they were lobbying us for regulation that suited them and kept out their competitors. Um, and, and, and if you are a well-organized company and you have a, an army of lobbyists or you can afford uh, lobbyists, you're probably going to be uh, lobbying the government and their special advisors at the moment to say, we are a strategic industry. And I think if you are going to, I'd rather you didn't go down this route, but if you are going to go down this route, I, I think the government has to be absolutely transparent. What are the criteria? What, what, it, what is, I think, as Jim O'Neill said, the conditionality? What are the conditions for the support? And is there a time frame or is there a sunset clause or is there a review clause? I'd rather you didn't go down the route, but let's be absolutely transparent. Is it possible to do this in a bipartisan way? Um, it could be, except, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, we did this in the European Parliament where we used to try and build, in, in European politics, it's far more consensus building because you, you need, you know, no party has a majority. And you can do that. And I remember having conversations a few years ago about, I think it was the subject of actually financial education where talking to Labour and Conservative politicians in the British Parliament, I said, look, there's an awful lot of consensus here between the two of you. You all think financial education is a great thing. Why don't you build that consensus and come up with a cross-party uh, arrangement? And what was interesting is that there is enough of a sort of overlap in the Venn diagram, but then sometimes there are politicians who can't resist throwing in their pet project. And clearly there'll be a lot of pressure on the left, for example, from trade unions, the larger trade unions who have a larger voice for some of the smokestack industries, or what we would call the smokestack industries. And, uh, and, and on the right, there will be people who say, you know, saying, uh, you know, we sh- we, you know, there's lots more innovative uh, projects out there. So I think there can be a consensus, but sometimes these consensus break down pretty quickly. I just Can I ask to- Kate well, one thing? I mean, a point that was made by Said about the uh, exacerbation of existing trends uh, particularly when it comes to globalization. We, we had a discussion a couple of days ago where on globalization where one view was that virtual, global, virtual services would globalize and anything which has to do with actual real goods would reshore. So you'd have a kind of bifurcation. Globalization would no longer be long supply chains for automobiles or something like that, but it will be Zoom discussions on legal affairs with, uh, with, with wherever it is, South Africa or Japan. I mean, what do you see as being the, the main trends in the, in the area of globalization? Are you looking for reshoring, shortening of supply chains and a degree of protectionism? So I think it's inevitable that there is going to be some short-term protectionism. I mean, you can't have the geopolitics as it currently is with China, the US, all sabre rattling and the EU actually standing up trying to make equal noise. So, I mean, the protectionism is there. I mean, you know, you've just got to look at von der Leyen's plans for, for changing state aid rules and, you know, changing takeover codes to prevent industries in, in Europe from, from outside uh, investors coming in and, and supposedly taking on strategic industries. It's, it's, you know, and that's probably at the milder end relative to what the Chinese sort of interference by state is currently. And the US don't interfere in quite the same way, but, you know, the t- trade 
barriers that they can put up through tariffs, you know, do the same job, whether or not it's, it's direct intervention in, in companies. So for me, in that atmosphere, you are going to have a period where those global supply chains are going to be redrawn and you will have different routes that you will decide to go by. And I do think there are certain trade corridors that are so important that you may end up taking the trade corridor route back. Uh, it, it was an old theory, and therefore I think it's it's being resurrected, where you know certain countries, their trade between them bilaterally is so important, you can rely upon them. And so you'll you'll end up having just the, the map redrawn in terms of those those trading partners. For me, I think it's it's short term. I think people will forget that the politics will change and, and you'll go back to the most efficient place to get your, your supply chain product from. Um, but in the short term, I do believe that globalization has had a bit of a, a bit of a kick and, and in products, services, I'm yet to see whether or not that survives. If the geopolitics is so severe that you're going to have trade wars, I'm not sure how you can bypass it for services. I think, uh, you know, the WTO is starting to talk about goods and services in the same breath will mean that you'll end up having the two mixed together. And, and this can be difficult to, to take on a service world fully globalized without some of the geopolitical impact on them too. And I'm a little more cynical, sadly. Said? Yes, um, funny enough, I've just, been, I've just finished writing a paper on the, uh, how COVID will uh, impact on global trade. And the WTO have uh, released their late forecast in April which, uh, which they predict rather wisely. They don't pick an exact figure. I mean, we know that most forecasts by defini defi definition are wrong. So you should always be avoid trying to pick a figure. But they do a range of scenarios. And what's interesting, even before, even in 2019, global trade volumes in merchandise, in goods, actually dropped slightly. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there was a slight leveling off in 2019. We saw, um, uh, it, we saw the financial crisis of 2008 hit uh, global trade volumes, it recovered, but at a, at, at a lower trajectory up to about 20, uh, 2019. Um, and they predict that global trade volumes will drop between 13 and 32%. Um, they, they will recover, but there are a number of existing trends, pre-existing trends, that may well affect that recovery. And a, a number of those trends include, for example, tensions with China, increasing protectionist noises from the US um, and the EU. Something that could be accelerated, but we haven't seen evidence of it yet. But at some stage, uh, 3D printing will affect some uh, manufacturing trade. There's still a debate about whether it actually replaces trade or it will replace existing manufacturing processes which are, of which the products are then exported. There's a debate between, for example, the World Economic Forum and the World, and, and the, um, and the World Bank about the impact of trade. But one report suggests it could replace 40% of exports. Um, between 2040, 2060. But we just don't know once again. Um, and the other thing is, uh, what was really interesting is um, consumer preferences. Um, there will be a lot of, um, you know, a lot of skepticism about um, uh, foreign trade and particularly some countries. And the interesting one also is supply chains. I think as Kay says, there will be some initial impact, but what are the alternatives in adjusting in just-in-time economies? Can companies really afford to build up larger inventories? Can they afford more storage space? Can they afford uh, what you call redundancy or duplication of supply chains? In many cases, they will go back to normal. And despite well, let, some let, of the, let me ask you on that. They've actually held up very well, a lot of global supply chains. Let, let me ask you on that, because it seems to me that we move from a just-in-time economy to a just-in-case economy, and that there will be high incentives to build redundancies into the system, even though they will be inefficient and I assume they will push up costs. You, you really feel that the economic driver will stop people moving from just in time to just in case? I, do, I think you've got to be very careful about trying to judge us at a macro level. It will be very much a company by company decision. Some companies will be able to afford that extra cost and that redundancy. Other companies will say that their margins are so critical that they will take the risk that there will not be another pandemic or another disruption for 10, 20 years, and they will live with that. It very much depends on company by company. But also, it depends on the geopolitics. You know, how are we going to react to China after this? There are already a number of concerns about China, you know, intellectual property rights, cyber terrorism, uh, sorry, cyber attacks, uh, you know, uh, their, their aggressiveness in their region. 
you know, we saw them killing, you know, their uh, effective invasion into India, their uh, actions in Hong Kong, their actions in Taiwan against the Malaysian oil rig, being rather aggressive. They haven't been exactly open with the world about the outbreak of COVID. Will we just go back to normal or will there be geopolitical implications? There are noises being made, but it's still too early to see, say how that will affect global supply chains. Well, you've asked the question, what's your, what's your bet? Um, I think uh, so, some companies, uh, I mean, I, I ran a webinar the other day with a, a couple of uh, Chinese experts and um, one was uh, the, the, the chief executive of a major European company. And he said to me, uh, look, you know, we'll just go back to normal. Really interesting. Others uh, on the debate said there will be more pressure um, internally within your countries to put pressure on China and not to depend on China so much. And it also depends whether there's a shift um, in um, consumer behavior and concerns about China. The, the assumption is that once Primark opens, people will rush back to Primark and happily buy Chinese products. Um, there could well be a consumer backlash. We don't know yet. Now, Jane. What, what, what scope is there actually for onshoring? I mean, there's, there's a couple of things that have come together there. Um, as Saeed says, um, there was pressure to diversify um, uh, d away from China before, in any case, before COVID struck. Um, but one of the things the pandemic has highlighted has been um, a shortage of capacity, you know, domestic capacity, whether it's making pr protective equipment or, uh, or, or, the, um, or, or, or drugs or whatever. So I just want, where are we at in terms of, of reshoring? And to what extent is that a sort of rational thing to do and without economic consequences and, or, or without bad consequences? And to what extent is it protectionist? Okay, your view on that. So we've got companies across the spectrum. So we've got companies who are looking at the supply chain and saying, you know, we're just going to diversify our sources. So rather than have single source supply, we're going to have at least two suppliers in different geographical regions to actually allow us to have that flexibility. That doesn't mean that they have to, to massively increase their cost base, but it, it does create an inefficiency by definition. But for them, it's, it's, it, that's a risk mitigation. And, and they've gone through their entire supply chain to identify where those critical points are and, and therefore look for the alternatives. <clears throat> we have got companies who are looking at reshoring, who are looking at where they can reopen a factory, where they might have, have moved it offshore um, in the recent past, and therefore can they reopen what they've closed. And we've got clients who said, Do you know, we moved our manufacturing decades ago out of the UK, but actually it makes sense now with the flexible workforce here and all sorts of, of economic indicators for us, it makes sense for us to bring some of this back more local. But it's, it's sector by sector, company by company. And, and there isn't a general rule. We're seeing big differences and divergences even within the same area of business. So it's, it's very much, as, as Said was suggesting, Everything is, is bespoke right now. It's company by company and all the way down to components of their supply chain, not, not just the, the biggest items, but even some of the small critical points where they've now, COVID has actually given them a stress test, a real life stress test that they would never have gone this harshly under their normal business conditions. So, you know, they really genuinely know for, for real which parts of their business are now susceptible and therefore can fix the problem. I mean, it's, it, I guess it's a, a real life story of, of you, know, you now know where your leaks are. You've, yeah. you've had the test, you know where the leaks are, you can patch them or you can replace the pipe. And, and you know, ultimately that's the decisions they're taking right now. And it's gonna take some companies a lot longer to, to work out what they're going to do. But it also gives you an opportunity potentially to digitize. You know, if you're going to actually now move to a more advanced manufacturing, you know, using 3D printers potentially, actually digitizing your factory so you don't have, you know, as much reliance on the old industries and potentially upgrading so your carbon footprint is so much better, then actually ultimately you're doing good all around by making that investment. And, People are having those discussions in their boardrooms right now. Or if not in their boardrooms, at least in their bedrooms. Um, can I ask, uh, let's bring this back to financial services. The City of London has been hit by, well, let's say, fears about Brexit. It's also been hit by fears about COVID-19. Uh, there's a lot going on looking forward. How, how do you see the City of London surviving through COVID and the transition for, for Brexit? Uh, Saeed first. <laughs> 
Well, I think it's, um, you know, one of the great things about London and the skills that we have attracted to London over, over many, many years um, is the fact that uh, is, is, is innovation. And people understanding markets, people looking at some innovative instruments. Sometimes they may well have got us into trouble with some of these instruments, and um, you know, there's a whole debate around those. But the fact that you, know, you speak to a number of people around the world, I think we'll be very careful about it. we don't get complacent. But a number of people like the fact that there's that sort of agglomeration effect, that there are, there are a number of experts here, there are a number of different sectors. It's not the banking sector or the insurance sector, or the accountancy sector, or the financial services consultancy sector, or the hedge funds, or the private equity. We have a number of those here which cross-fertilize asset management, banking, sell side, buy side. And having those skills together really helps London. Um, and you know, we forget, we talk about the city, but we also have the second largest financial uh, district in Europe, which is Canary Wharf. So if you put, you know, London itself is a major financial hub. And as long as we continue to make sure that we create that space, we don't over-regulate, we have the appropriate regulation in terms of uh, capital requirements. Or we look at, I know Jay and I have had these conversations about things like accounting standards, um, but we have the appropriate regulations in place and we, get, we have that space for that innovation and we don't over-regulate. London can continue to thrive. But at the same time, we have to be aware that there will be other places in the world who want to take those jobs away from London. And quite rightly, that's what you see in a, in, in a, in a competitive uh, global economy. But let me ask you then, we're moving at least some of our work into a sort of new virtual normal. Um, will that hurt, hurt London? Because you will no longer necessarily have that kind of agglomeration of skills. It may be possible to talk to your accountant, say, in, in your, your accountant in Frankfurt or your lawyer in Paris or wherever. You wouldn't have necessarily to bring the same agglomeration of skills together into one geographic area. Is that, is that something that worries you for the future of London? Uh, not, 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 not necessarily. No, because you know, um, um, you know, we, we, we'll happily adapt. I mean, it, uh, it, and also, if you look at the different sectors, um, you know, yes, many of us work in sectors that you know, I've, I've quite happily worked at home for the last. Well, not happily, but I've worked at home for the last thirteen weeks, um, fourteen weeks. I've had no need to go go go, go into the office. There are some, um, you know, uh, some sectors, some parts of the financial services where. Um, you know, it may not be five days a week in the, in the office, but they might. They, you know, some of the companies on an individual level may well go to more more of a mixed uh, working patterns. Maybe they maybe they might actually, maybe one of the implications that they might take less space. They might decide that you know with staff being able to work remotely when they want and less staff coming in, maybe there will be more hot desking. But once again, that depends on a, on a company by company basis. They will all react differently. Some companies will think it worked really well and productivity either increase or didn't change that much. Others will say, no, we've noticed a real change. And as soon as lockdown's over, or you're ready to come back, we, 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 we want you back here. Um, there, could be, I mean, if I, you know, there could be potential uh, for other um, financial districts to take, to take advantage of this. But I think those same competitive pressures existed anyway, even before COVID. Can I ask Jane, uh, sorry, can I ask Kay just to... to bring in the European dimension here. I mean, the Capital Markets Union was, we perceived anyway, absolutely crucial to the future of London because we were the provider of much of the skills required for an effective capital market union. And other, I mean, we will still have obviously a very close relationship with Europe. Do you feel that within Europe there is a sort of loss of momentum when it comes to capital market union and might that affect uh, the City of London or UK financial services? So this is a really strange one because the Capital Markets Union project was a Jean-Claude Juncker plan when he came in as the Commission President in 2014. And of course, we had Jonathan Hill as the UK Financial Services Commissioner at the time who was tasked with delivering the, the Juncker CMU, as it, it became known. The Capital Markets plan, of course, was uh, assuming that you had the Global Financial Centre within the EU of London and that that global financial center would effectively be the center and you'd have the hub and spoke model so that you develop all of those other financial markets relying on each other to actually get those synergies with London then um, you know midway through that in, in 2016 with the UK with the referendum result that we had suddenly removing the global financial center from the middle of that model 
they had to scramble together to say, well, actually, no, it doesn't change anything. CMU is now more important than ever. Well, it is, but you no longer have the hub. So you now have to create new hubs. And of course, the problem within that European system is they can't decide upon a single hub. So you've now got multiple hubs. So you're actually deciding on a very different type of system. So you're diluting your synergies. You're diluting your, your strengths of having one place where all of those skill sets come together in the way that Saeed described. And if you don't have all of those in one place, so it looks very likely that you know trading activity, so those who are actually physically doing the trading and the MTFs and, and exchanges will actually have a hub in Amsterdam. It looks very much as if the big dealers who are much of the users of, of those trading platforms will be based in Frankfurt or in Paris. And you have a large number of, of buy side entities who are going to be in Luxembourg or in Dublin. Those aren't synergistic in terms of the effects. And I don't think financial markets are still digital enough to allow the service element of this to actually get those synergies in the same way being remote. And even though you know I've I've managed fairly successfully remotely um, from remote Worcestershire to actually do my job rather than in Canary Wharf for the last few months, it doesn't allow me to benefit from that interaction with colleagues. So I've run a, a number of, of brainstorming sessions uh, for colleagues in the last few weeks, and it's incredibly difficult to do that over an electronic medium. And you don't pick up on the signals. I mean, doing a virtual pitch to a client is extremely difficult. You know, not having the normal signals. And it's it's been quite an eye-opener for me to realize how much you rely upon those, those subliminal messagings and little gestures that you miss on the, the video. And, and you can't have that, that space to be able to develop your argument in a way that's appropriate. You end up doing a set piece which is never going to deliver in the same way as something that gets tailored as the client gives you information, gives you a steer, you can tailor your, your presentation to them. And so I think the personal contact is going to be very important. The, the personal client relationships will still exist. I think many of the mundane tasks will, will go to a remote and, and you know, people who don't need to be in the office and don't need to, to have that synergistic effect with colleagues will be able to just do their routine jobs from wherever they want to. Um, let me ask you the question, London. How does how does London come out of all of this? I mean, we've talked you've talked about, I think very convincingly, about different hubs setting up in different capitals for different skills. Uh, but where does London come? So I think London continues as a global financial centre for as long as we stay relevant. So London needs to stay relevant by innovating. It needs to have an open access policy so that anyone who wants to trade through our markets in London can do so, provided that they, they abide by the rules that we have locally. We need to also make sure that we don't take the same attitude as the EU has historically to third countries in terms of equivalence decisions. They should not be political decisions at all. They should be technical. And therefore, you know, it should be a very simple regulator's announcement that somebody has or hasn't met the criteria for being able to trade in our markets and provide services to, to clients from the UK. And in terms of regulation, you know, the UK regulators were at the heart of the European system. So I don't for a minute think that we're going to undo decades of, of financial regulation. But I do think there were many things, and Saeed and I can probably recite a whole, you know, sort of gamut of them in terms of regulations that have got bits and articles in them that the UK fought very hard against that we did not want included, but as part of the compromise on the bigger piece of legislation, we had to let certain things go. And I would rewrite those overnight. And, you know, things like solvency too, where they prevent the long-term pension fund holders and the long-term insurance policy holders who need a long-term annuity from investing in infrastructure in the UK. It's crazy. But nobody across the continent understood this because they don't have the same pre-funded model that we have in our pension funds. So we need to change that. And you know, we can now take some of the things that we had to compromise on without fundamentally changing the basis of that regulation. You know, we still believe in, in efficient markets. We still believe in regulated markets. But there is an awful lot on MIFID too, 
I could red pen tomorrow and make it better and more effective for wholesale markets as well as for the retail markets and potentially dividing the two because your protection for consumers is very different for a retail customer to that for a very large pension fund or indeed a huge asset manager. What would you do, say, to uh, to, to improve, in, increase the UK's competitiveness going forward in the financial services sector? I think uh, I wouldn't disagree very much with what Kay said in terms of the principles. Make sure that we are open. Make sure we're transparent in, in criteria, for example, equivalence criteria. The other thing I would do, though, and I think this is a problem with our governments of all political persuasions, is I remember a few years ago when I was working on a project uh, with some potential investors who wanted to build a brand new airport in London. Of course, that was a political decision, but they, they were willing to fund it completely private, private well, uh, without state money. Um, it was a number of overseas uh, sovereign wealth funds. So it wasn't necessarily our government money, it could well have been others' government's money. And when I went to the, uh, talk to them and I said, why aren't you investing more in infrastructure? Why does the government feel it has to fund a lot of our infrastructure out of taxpayers' money? He said to me, the problem is governments don't realize that we have to make a return as well. They think that when we say that we have to make a return, that we're trying to fleece them. But you know, there is a way that they could um, you know, adjust the contracts to make sure that we make, en- we make enough of a return that's worth our while putting that money in as a, as a, large, you know, as, as a large investor. I remember talking to a very large UK-based investor, and I said, well, where do you put your money? He said, well, we put our money where the government doesn't really interfere so much. So, for example, an awful lot of asset managers are put- were putting money at the time into uh, student housing, for example. Um, now, one, it's very interesting after COVID, what will our universities be like? Uh, will some of them go remote, for example? But, and then I said, why do you do that? I said, because we can make a return on that. Now, in, similarly, we would put far more, mo- far, far more money into motorways, airports, railways, HS2, for example, but the government doesn't understand that we have to make it, it has to be worth our while. And I would like, um, you know, whoever it is in the Treasury to have a sensible conversation with some of these uh, large asset, you know, uh, asset managers who are willing to invest money in infrastructure to come to an agreement where perhaps they could invest, make a sufficient return without the government thinking that they're trying to fleece a tax, you know, or a fleece them. The last word, Jane, should be with you. What do you take out of this discussion? Are you optimistic um, or are you pessimistic? Uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm optimistic because I think we've had quite a lot of um, nitty-gritty and pragmatic um, answers and uh, um, analysis. Um, so, you know, for example, as Kay said right at the beginning, the way that small smaller businesses are actually going to get um, rescued or uh, allowed further to be an orderly transition is because um, the government has guaranteed loans. So either the business will be viable after the massive grant that's, that, that, that is the furlough scheme, or if it isn't, um, then the defaults will be backed by the government guarantee so that the banking system is at least to some extent protected. Mm. So I think that's that's a practical view. I think the, the conversation about supply chains was also practical. There was already some a, a case for diversification um, and that was laid out quite clearly in terms of uh, how that's now been carried through to mitigate dependency risks. Um, and I also think there's some intriguing issues to do with exports. The, um, it's the first conversation we've had since which has mentioned um 3d printing for manufacturing and i think that there's you know that that just gives me hope because it shows that there's going to be innovations that we can barely imagine at the moment that that will will change things it doesn't all have to be top down okay i just take away from this that uh, saeed and kay ought to set up a joint committee <laughs> where they go through all the existing EU legislation in the financial services sector that they looked at so closely when they were in Brussels, striking out precisely those points that they would like to see the UK drop in order to improve the UK's financial competitiveness. But thank you, Kay. Thank you, Said. Thank you, obviously, Jane. And thank you all for watching. 